In fact, there is a, a, a hadith, a tradition of the Prophet, uh, alayhi, uh, salam, in which he says, um, ma yakunu abdu min rabbihi, closest to Allah, or close, closest is the servant to Allah, uh, or to his Lord, sajidun, when he is, while he is in a state of prostration. Um, in fact, the hadith continues uh, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a result of being so close to Allah when you are in a state of uh, prostration, uh, he says, dua. And so, you know, supplicate uh, extensively therein. And so very, you know, uh, very important hadith. Like, look at what it, it illustrates to us that in order to be as close to Allah as you can, meaning in order for you to ha be uh, have the highest level of God consciousness, elevated, the most elevated form or level of God consciousness, you need to physically be as low as you can possibly be. Closest to Allah or the closest time that the servant is to his Lord is while he is in a state of prostration. Interesting that you'd lower yourself, you humbled yourself and Allah will elevate you spiritually to degrees and ranks that you wouldn't, you wouldn't consider possible otherwise. You know, even in the New Testament, I believe it is in Matthew 26, verse 39, in which the most desperate moment in the life of Jesus, according to the New Testament, of course, um, is when the uh, leaders of the rabbinical order, when the Romans and so forth are after him, he's in a state of desperation. He doesn't know what to do. He's at a loss. He's completely worried. He's in a state of anxiety. So much so that this same prophet, our prophet, um, according to the Bible, when he says, if somebody slaps you, simply turn the other cheek, he must have been so desperate that now he's saying to his disciples, pick up your swords. If anybody were to come, if anybody were to interrupt or try and take me, slay them. And so after saying that, in his state of desperation, he withdraws a little bit, he withdraws. Uh, to, a, to, a, uh, to a distance from his companion, uh, his disciples, and he places his forehead on the ground, uh, not unlike how a Muslim places their forehead on the ground day in, day out, in order to try and bring themselves closer to their nurturing, loving Lord. He also does that, and he says, you know, I don't like saying Father, um, he says, in essence, my Lord, let this cup pass from me. He's groaning in the spirit. Yeah, and he doesn't know what to do. He's desperate. And so he places his forehead to the ground. He goes as low as you can go and says, let this cup pass from me, not by my will, because he doesn't have the will to do so. That's why he's reaching out to God, but by your will. And so it is important that we understand that in order to elevate spiritually it can't, be, it can't be a show, I'm thinking of Kant again, the uh, uh, letter to the Enlightenment period of the, uh, the secular um, progress in recent history. Um, you can't act as though you're humble, because that, sh that can be a form of showing off. Um, you need to truly make yourself humble, uh, humble. Your inward state must become humble. And you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help in order to do that. You need to be sincere. You need to reflect upon yourself uh, and predominantly use the tools that Allah has given you to the best of your ability in order to transform your inward state. And that's what ibadah um, uh, has a great purpose in bringing about. Um, so humbling yourself physically will elevate the self, inshallah metaphysically elevating your consciousness of god and therefore reducing your proximity to your creator you know being boastful and being you know full of pride can jeopardize your um your journey and your path to become inwardly humble and arrogance and pride 
while symbolically, when one is in a state of arrogance and pride, they tend to sort of puff themselves up. And look, it's the, it's the opposite effect. You know, humbling the self, one prostrates, goes as low as they can. But when one's in a state of arrogance and pride, even if they don't show it symbolically, inwardly they perceive themselves as above everybody else. It's that, again, that which is related to the finite dimension elevate is eleva elevates oneself or one's elevating themselves. But in the spiritual or metaphysical dimension, one is being lowered. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is addressing Iblis, he says, um, yeah. يعني, There is no place uh, for your pride and arrogance here, is what Allah is telling him. Yeah. يعني, Pride and arrogance cannot coexist with the heavenly realm. It cannot coexist. It doesn't have a place there. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, depart, be gone. Very important here. That while his arrogance and pride may make him think that he is above and higher than anybody else, in reality, what Allah is saying is, you are in fact one of those who are belittle. You are insignificant. Insignificant. You've been reduced. Your status has been reduced. Your degree has been reduced. Okay. Uh, so the opposite comes about. And therefore, we need to rid ourselves of pride and arrogance in order to be elevated rather than being stooped in pride and arrogance. And we are lowered as a result. We become insignificant, diminished as a result of that. Now, Humility will bring about a sense of never being sure of yourself. Yani, even if you are successful, you are successful uh, due to the grace and love and mercy of Allah SWT. As such, you will do your utmost not to bring harm onto anybody else or criticize anybody else. Um, Avoiding it as much as possible. Avoiding it as much as possible. And sometimes one wonders, you know, even amongst those people that do prostrate so often. And you, you know how we said that uh, worship is something that has a transformative effect. It has a transformative effect only if you are devoutly worshipping Allah. And only if there is an internal aspect mechanism to that worship as well. If it's just the forms of bowing, standing, and prostrating, while there is some benefit in this, um, the, the, a true transformation does not occur, and eleva elevation um, uh, does not occur when it is void of the internal dimension of worship. And so sometimes you see people that pray five times a day. In fact, they're spiritual guides, you know, um, they're in the role of spiritual guides, and yet they make uh, mistakes so readily and so easily without any fear of recompense, without any worry, without any um, uh, anxiety uh, uh, as to the repercussions of their actions. And so how do we then reconcile that? A person that is undertaking these aspects of worship, and yet they are still doing wrongs uh, that are that's so detrimental, evil, and repugnant, um, that they do it without flinching. And, you know, this relates to one's journey, the wayfarer's journey to try and get closer to their Lord. We need to be cautious of certain things that can impede, not only impede that uh, hour, drawing closer, but actually take us further and further away without us realizing it. So how does one do this? You know, one of the common ones, and I'll discuss this as often as possible, um, because all it is, is, again, is the wagging of the tongue. Um, is backbiting and slander, uh, you know, being a tail bearer, uh, which, you know, has many different repercussions. You know, you're causing hatred between two Muslims, between two believers or two human beings, um, just by the wagging of your tongue. And so that's why it is quite vile and quite wretched. Um, and so when we see this happening, you know, even amongst those that we assume were pious, because when you look at the outward form, they may have a lot, they may have retained a lot of information in Islam. They may have done a lot of courses in Islam. And I say retained information and not the acquisition of knowledge because of the way in which they act, even after uh, 
uh, attaining so much information, you know, maybe spending 10 years of uh, studying Islam. How do they so readily and so easily, without flinching, for example, um, involve themselves in backbiting, something so repugnant and evil? Um, two things that I want to cover. There are more, two potential reasons why somebody can be in this state. Number one, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Inna Allah, uh, Inna Allah tayyibun la yaqbala illa tayyibat. Indeed, Allah is good and pure, um, you know, is good, and he accepts that which is good. And, you know, some of the scholars have translated it to imply that it is uh, purity as well. And he accepts that which is pure. Now, the hadith continues, and, you know, uh, in which the Prophet, والسلام, references uh, the Quran about eating that which is lawful and so forth. But the end is what I think is very um, relevant to what we, you know, to this discussion, in which the Prophet mentions a case in, you know, elaborating on this, you know, elaborating in particular the outset. Inna Allah ta'ibun la yaqbal illa yaqbal illa illa ta'ibun. And he mentions a man having journeyed far. You know, it's, a, it's someone that's traveling quite a distance. He's, you know, disheveled and dusty. I mean, his hair may be full of dust and disheveled, um, you know, and there's dust over him that implies perhaps poverty in addition to uh, traveling and journeying. And then this individual, the same individual also stretches out his hands, you know, obviously facing towards the palms, facing towards the heavens in the proper etiquette of making dua. You know, uh, the Prophet, uh, والسلام, he said, at dua huwa al -ibad, that the dua is an ibadah. And if you look at the different forms of you know, ibadah that we conduct, in, in, in particular the formal rituals, they all have an entrance and an exit. For example, um, the salah's entrance is the takbir, and the exit is the uh, taslim. Uh, in terms of fasting, the entrance is sahur, uh, we make the intention sahur, and we enter the fast, and the exit is the moment of iftar. Um, and similarly, there's the rituals related to this for the hajj as well, entering into the formal aspect of it and then exiting the formal aspect of it. And hence, he raises the hands, which is the entrance of supplicating, the proper etiquette of supplicating. Um, and then in addition to that, he says, um, uh, oh Lord, oh Lord. Um, yeah, and he, acknowledging that he is calling upon not just anybody, he's calling upon his master, he's calling upon his creator, he's calling upon his sustainer and his, his nurturing Lord. So it, look, look at the significance that the dua is more readily accepted for the one that is journeying, right? The one that's journeying, uh, it is highly likely for their dua, if the conditions are right to be accepted over and above if they are not journeying. Um, the poor person has very few veils between himself and Allah. So the impoverished one, likely again, for that dua um, to be answered. Um, in addition, the proper etiquette, raising of the hands, calling upon Ya Rab, Ya Rab. You know, if you read Surah Al-Fatiha, it's almost as though the Surah is teaching you the proper etiquette of dua, because at the beginning is the acknowledgement understanding who your creator is, your relationship with your creator, that he is the master of all things. And then once you've acknowledged that, then you make the, uh, the supplication. Ihdina as al mustaqim Ihdina, not me. Ihdina, the pronoun used is show us, guide us to what? as al mustaqim But even though this person fulfills all of these conditions, look at the outward form seems right. Yeah? This is somebody whose spiritual degree should be elevated. This is somebody whose proximity to Allah should be reduced. And yet the Prophet says, even though he's done all this, while his food is haram, his drink is haram, what he clothes himself with is haram, huh? and what he nourishes the cells and the organs is haram, how can his prayer be answered? Not necessarily saying it won't, but illustrating, insinuating that it is highly unlikely. So 
how then can this individual that conducts all of these good deeds so easily backbite and slander, conduct one of the most evil, wretched, repugnant things uh, without even flinching, slandering somebody behind their back, causing them pain and difficulty, affecting their reputation and their honor. Being so honorless as to try and destroying the honor of another creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the answer is, look at whether or not his income or her income is lawful. Yani, are you conning your employer and gaining an income? Are you saying that you're working this many hours? You know, that you've been given a task that you should be conducting, you know, every minute of that uh, time that you're being paid to work, you're not working. You know, you're doing things that uh, are not very proactive. You know, you could be, you know, doing something for the cause of, you know, whatever it is that your company is involved with whether it's religious, whether it's something that, you know, uh, industry-based, uh, in, you know, in the corporate world. And then you're taking that income that you didn't deserve lawfully, or you swindled somebody and you took this income, or whatever it may be, and then you're nourishing your limbs, and you're nourishing that of your family as well. You're nourishing the family, you're clothing your family. And this nourishment, this nourishment of the cells, you know, which then become the tissues and the organs, you are then using this organ that is nourished with haram, this tongue, to supplicate to your Lord. The limbs that you raise that were nourished with haram to supplicate to your Lord. The clothing that you wear while doing so, earned with haram to supplicate. Well, how is your heart going to be? How is the purity of the heart going to be in that regard? How much illumination will the heart receive? How much purification will the heart undertake in that regard? And so, of course, one will not flinch when they're conducting uh, these types of evils, causing fitna between people. 